Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. Hey, it's uh, so great to be back here at FaithBridge. Again, my name is Timothy Atik, and I'm the director of Breakaway Ministries in College Station. And I just love this church and love the support that FaithBridge has shown Breakaway for so many years. And so thanks for having me back. I want to start out this morning by telling you that yesterday, my wife and I celebrated our 12, not 12 year, 11 year anniversary. (laughs) And so thanks. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. So we've been married for 12 years, which means that we started dating almost exactly 12 years ago. And for our second date, I took my wife, Catherine, to the State Fair of Texas, and we decided to ride the Texas Sky Coaster. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Texas Sky Coaster. If you're not, it's that, uh, that crane where you get strapped into these body harnesses and they connect you together and then a crane raises you up in the air about 189 feet to where you're just kind of hanging out, dangling there, and then a cord gets ripped and then this crane turns into a big swing and you're just swinging back and forth. I figured if anything was gonna get our new relationship heading in the right direction, it was gonna be the Texas Sky Coaster. And the reason for that is if you think about um, first dates, first dates are all about controlling appearances, right? It's all about deception. You're trying to deceive the person into thinking that you're someone that you're really not. You're clean when you're not. You, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. It's all about controlling appearances. Well, you get on the Texas Sky Coaster and everything changes. Because when you get raised up in the air 189 feet, the last thing you have is control. So if you want to know something about someone, if you want to learn what someone's like really quickly, just take them on the Sky Coaster and see how they respond to having no control. All right? Just go to the State Fair and just sit and watch how people handle riding the Sky Coaster. I'll tell you how I responded to being in a situation where I, where I had zero control. What I did was I just involuntarily started singing. <laughs> like I, I did not choose to sing. As the crane lifted us up, I kid you not, I just started going, it's a beautiful day. <laughs> Skies roll, it feels like a beautiful day. Just impressing the heck out of Catherine. (laughs) And then the cord got ripped and we started swinging. And I involuntarily, I don't know why, but this is what I began to yell. And it could probably be heard all over the State Fair of Texas. But as we were singing, I was screaming, oh my gentle Judas. And I don't know why. (laughs) I have no clue why. But that's what came out. (laughs) This morning, I want to talk about how we respond to times in life where we have no control. And I hope I'm not telling you anything new, but there's going to be plenty of times in life where you have zero control over your circumstances or how a certain aspect of your life is going to turn out. Let me just ask, anyone stressed out right now? Anyone dealing with some anxiety right now? I guarantee you that at the root of your stress and your anxiety is actually a lack of control. Maybe you're single and you don't want to be. Maybe your house has been devastated by Harvey and that's the last thing that you would want for your house. Maybe no matter how hard you try, your kids just aren't shaping up to be the kids that you were hoping that they would be. Maybe things at work are not going well at all. 
Maybe you've been unemployed for far longer than you ever thought that you would be. Maybe a loved one is sick and they just won't seem to turn a corner. I would imagine that there's many aspects of your life that you just can't control. Stress and anxiety, at the root of that stress and anxiety is a lack of control. This is one of the harsh realities of life, that we want to be in control and we just can't be. What I want to do this morning is I want to identify what I believe personally are the three greatest areas of life where we want control but don't have it. And those three areas are our enoughness, our pain, and our futures. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but it is a convicting list. But here's my hope. My hope is that even in the midst of talking about the fact that we have no control over how certain aspects of life are going to play out, what I hope you feel is peace and joy in this simple truth. You don't have to be in control because Jesus Christ already is. This morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what is considered one of the most loved chapters in the entire Bible. If you're new to church or haven't been around church for a while, there's still a good chance that you've had exposure to this text. It's the 23rd Psalm. And what the 23rd Psalm is going to do is it's going to give us Three statements that we can declare when we are in the midst of scenarios where we have no control. If you will track with me, if you will follow along with, with what David has for us this morning, that when, then when you find yourself in moments that you cannot control, you will be able to declare, I lack nothing. I will fear no evil, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And those statements might not make perfect sense to you right now, but I promise you, as we begin to unpack this this psalm, then you will find these phrases deeply resonating with the longings of your soul. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, and if you need a Bible, some people are passing them out right now, but Psalm 23 is where we're going to be. Let me read through the entire psalm, and as we, as we read, I want to pinpoint our three phrases and just tell you what aspect of our lives they're going to associate with. David starts out and says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That phrase, I shall not want, can also be translated, I lack nothing. That's going to deal with our enoughness. He goes on and says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. That's our second phrase. And that phrase has everything to do with our pain. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That last phrase, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, has to do with our future. These three phrases could be phrases packed full of peace for your soul if you will allow them to to sink down deep and impact the areas of your life where you have no control. What you need to know is Psalm 23 was written by David. David, early on in his life, was a shepherd. So he took care of sheep. And then later in life, he became the second king of the nation of Israel. And what you need to know is in the ancient Near East, uh, kings were often referred to as shepherds. David starts out the 23rd Psalm by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. Now that might be foreign terminology to us, but it was very personal for David. 
Because as David looked back on his time leading and caring for sheep, and then later in life leading and caring for the people of Israel, it prompted him to view God as his shepherd to say, you know what, the Lord is the one who leads and cares for me. The Lord is the one who knows what I need. The Lord is the one who provides for me and protects me. The Lord is my king. Now, I want you to think about this. David knew what it was like to be someone in control. He was well acquainted with power and wealth. He had been in charge of sheep, but he had also been king of a nation. And yet, even as a king who had massive amounts of wealth, power, and control, his life was no different than anyone else's in the fact that even his life had moments and aspects that he simply could not control. And so he came to a point where he realized he didn't have to be in control because his shepherd already was, which prompted him to declare, the Lord is my shepherd. David came to a, to a place where he was willing to submit his life to the leadership of the God of the universe, his shepherd. Interestingly, Jesus actually picks up this shepherd imagery in John chapter 10. Look at what he says in John chapter 10, verse, verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus picks up this shepherd imagery. And the reason you need to know that is because Jesus Christ wants to be your shepherd today. And just as David submitted his life to the leadership of the God of the universe, you have to make a choice whether you will be willing to submit your life to the leadership of Jesus Christ. Will you let Jesus be the one to step in and lead and care for your life? Will you let Jesus be the one who protects and provides? Will you let Jesus Christ be your king? Because if you will, it will have everything to do with your peace in the midst of chaos and a lack of control. So let me just walk you through this, and let me hit on these three areas where we want control but don't have it. The first area where we, where we long for control but don't have it is, is in the area of our enoughness. When I talk about our enoughness, I'm talking about this deep need in every single person's soul in here, this need to know that you are enough. It's rooted in the question, am I enough? I want you to just fill in this blank. Am I blank enough? What would you put in that blank? What question is your soul asking right now? Maybe it's, am I smart enough? Am I successful enough? Am I pretty enough? Am I wealthy enough? Am I well-spoken enough? Am I high capacity enough? Am I engaging enough? Am I funny enough? Am I strategic enough? Am I caring enough? What is it for you? What question is deep down in your soul? See, we want to know if we are enough. And unfortunately, because there's something inside of us asking that question, am I enough? You know what life is like for so many of us? Life is just like one unending version of the TV show, The Voice. If you've never watched the TV show, The Voice, people stand on a stage and they audition for a panel of judges. And that's life for so many of us. So many of us spend every day auditioning for a hand-picked panel of judges. And only you know who's on your panel. Every person's panel looks different. But that panel is a panel of judges that has been hand-picked by you. And your desire is to perform for them enough to be enough for them to hit their buzzer and turn their chair around demonstrating their acceptance of you. So I don't know who's on your panel, but let me just give you a few examples. 
Maybe for you, on your panel is, is family. And this can be many different people, but I want to focus in especially on, on parents being on your panel. And if you are a parent, the bottom line is you might still have parents. And I think that so many of us go through life with different wounds in our soul from interactions that we've had with our parents. And maybe you're still asking, even at the age of 35 or 45 or 50, even if your parents are now deceased, maybe you still ask the question, am I successful enough for my parents? Am I responsible enough for my parents? Am I attractive enough for my parents? Am I lovable enough for my parents? Maybe on your panel is, it's, it's his or her, it's him or her. And maybe it's, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your wife or your husband, maybe you're single and it's a guy or a girl that you would love to date, but they're just not interested in you right now. You want to date them, but something deep down in you wonders, am I desirable enough. Maybe you've, you wonder this with your spouse. Am I desirable enough? Am I captivating enough? Am I engaging enough? Am I funny enough for this person to truly want me? Maybe on your panel as an employer. And maybe something in you just wants to know. Am I I engaging enough? Am I competent enough? Am I distinct enough? Am I well-spoken enough? High capacity enough for this person to value me in this place of work? Maybe on your panel is God. I mean, can we just be honest and say that for, for many of us, we wake up feeling like we have to audition for God every single day, and something in us is asking the question, God, am I spiritual enough for you? Am I godly enough for you? Am I disciplined enough for you? Am I loving enough for you? Am I moral enough for you? And this becomes our life. We, we spend all of our days auditioning in front of a hand-picked panel of judges longing to know that we're enough. But you know what the crazy thing is? The crazy thing is that we have zero control over the people on our panel. The reality is you might never be enough for your parent. And that's not your fault. It's possible that your parent is operating with such an unrealistic set of expectations that no one could ever measure up to them. It's possible that your parent is dealing with certain insecurities in their own life that manifest, itself, manifest themselves in the way that they parent you. If you're single and you don't want to be and there's a guy or a girl that you want to want you, you know what? People are weird when it comes to romantic love. People create these lists of, of expectations that they want for their future spouses. And so you know what? You can't make someone fall in love with you. We try and control the people that are on our panel of judges, and we just can't, but it promotes all types of unhealthiness in us. Like we become workaholics. We wear busyness around like it's a badge of honor. Our lives become very imbalanced, where we're working crazy hours, we're eating terribly, we're never exercising, and yet we wear that busyness around and that fatigue and that tiredness that uh, I'm only sleeping three or four hours a night and then I get up and man, I just grind again. There is nothing noble about that. There is nothing noble about an imbalanced, unhealthy life. Many of us, we try and control the people on our panel, and you know what it does? It, it creates 
anxiety disorders inside of us. Just think about that word disorder. In our attempt to move toward order, we're actually moving toward chaos because we want to be in control. You need to know there is a much better way. There's a much better way. Look back at the text. Look at what it says in Psalm 23. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I lack nothing. Do you, can you just feel the, the freedom and the relief and the release that comes from those words? I lack nothing. I shall not want. Can you just sense the chains that are tethering you to the audition stage kind of breaking apart? It's possible. Because you have a good shepherd who wants to end the audition of your life permanently. Look at what it says. Verse 2, it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. I can also read, he, he makes me lie down in places of rest in green pastures. It says, he leads me beside still waters or waters of rest. He restores my soul, which means he insists on your soul flourishing in life. It says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He is committed to leading you to the best life possible. You have a shepherd who wants to end your auditions for enoughness. He wants to lead you to rest and peace if you will let him. What you need to realize is that the reason we're gathered here today is because we have good news to celebrate. We're not here to be more moral people. We're not here because attending church is a good thing. Attending church is a good thing. But we are really here because we are gathering around really good news. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to know that the message of the gospel is a message about our enoughness. It is. Listen to the words of Romans 3, 23. This is a verse about en enoughness. It says this. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this is kind of interesting because what the Bible would say is if you're asking the question, are you enough, you need to know the answer is no. <laughs> For all have sinned and fall short. No, you're not enough. If you want to know if you're enough, no. <laughs> Isn't that good news? Welcome to church. Jesus loves you. Have a great day. But the interesting thing is you cannot be a Christian until you realize that you, in fact, are not enough. And that's okay. You don't have to be enough because Jesus Christ has come and he has been enough for you. Listen to, re, to, to 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says this, for our sake, he, that's God, the Father made him, that's Jesus Christ, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So if you want to know why, why we value the cross, why a cross is so central to Christianity is because on that cross, Jesus Christ dealt with all of the ways that we are not enough, all of the ways that we have fallen short, all of our sin, Jesus Christ got up on a cross and, and endured the wrath of God that was rightfully ours. He was punished in our place. He then died, was buried, but then on the third day, he walked out of a tomb, demonstrated that he had conquered sin and death. What this verse is saying, it's called the great exchange. Jesus gets all of our sin, all of the ways that we haven't been enough, Jesus gets that. And in turn, he gives us his enoughness. Jesus Christ came and lived the life that we couldn't. His life is now somehow credited to our accounts so that when God the Father looks at us, he no longer sees us but his son Jesus. So all of the love that he feels towards Jesus, he feels for us. All of the delight and pleasure that he feels in his son Jesus, he now feels for 
us. We are now enough because Jesus Christ has made us enough. And this has huge implications because just think about it. It ends the auditions because if you want to know if you are enough for a family member, specifically a parent, well, the gospel declares that you are now adopted by by the God of the universe. And the beauty of adoption is that someone has to choose you and you're chosen out of love and it's not because of performance. If you want to know if you're enough for romantic love, well, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings refers to you and all of his people as his bride. If you want to know if you're enough for an employer, Well, the king of kings calls you his ambassador. He could change the world however he wants. He wants to do it through you. He makes you his representative. If you want to know if you're enough for God, well, God looks at you and sees that you are righteous because the righteousness of his son, Jesus, has been credited to your account. Jesus ends the audition. He cancels your season of the voice. So when you find yourself on the Texas sky coaster of your enoughness, you know what you can declare? You don't need to say, oh, my gentle Judas. You don't need to involuntarily start singing. You can declare, I lack nothing. The second area of our lives where we want control but just don't seem to have it is in regard to our pain. Hopefully I'm just stating the obvious, but there will be many times in life where you're going to find yourself walking through a valley. Pain is a reality of this life. Heartache, heartbreak, and loss happen. And I kind of see the, I see pain fleshed out in two different ways. There's unnecessary pain and there's unavoidable pain. Unnecessary pain is pain that comes from your compromising choices. It's completely avoidable. But then there's unavoidable pain, which means you didn't do anything to deserve it. You can't do anything to avoid it. It's coming for you whether you want it or or not. So loved ones get sick, cancer happens, hurricanes devastate. And the reality is that there are probably hundreds of people in this room right now who feel like they are in the midst of a valley. I mean, let me just, let me just ask, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't feel comfortable, but if you feel like you are in the midst of pain or walking through a valley right now, would you just slip up your hand real quick? That's great. Several hands going up. Thanks for being honest. If that's you right now, if you feel like you're in the valley right now, there's two things that I want you to know. Number one, I hope you can look around and see you're not alone. But the second thing that I want you to know is that your tendency is going to be to try and control your pain. You're going to try and control it. Look back at what the text says in verse 4. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Here's what I want you to notice. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Doesn't that sound interesting? That he's walking like he's not in a hurry. Like he's just taking a sweet love and time in the valley of the shadow of death. That's not how we tend to deal with pain. When we find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death, we want our verse to read, even though I am running for my life through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I am doing my best to claw my way out of the valley of the shadow of death. That's how we want our verse to read. Because we want to get away from pain as quickly as possible. So we try and control our pain and There's four ways that I think we try and control our pain. These are your options if you're in the midst of a valley or when a valley comes, you've got four options. You can numb it, you can suppress it, you can fake it, or you can embody it. Some of us try and numb our pain. We numb it by drinking too much. 
We numb it by spending too much. We numb it with prescription pills, starving ourselves, harming ourselves. We try and numb it. Second way that we can deal with pain is we try and suppress it. So what we do is we try and busy ourselves. We pack our calendar full. We work really late so that we never have to think about what's really going on in our hearts. Third way we deal with pain is we fake it. We try and tell our pain, you're not gonna get me down. And so we show the world, no, I'm good, I'm fine. This doesn't affect me. In the meantime, your soul is decaying. Fourth way we deal with pain is we embody it. Like we make pain our anthem. And it manifests itself in bitterness, in anger, in resentment toward the world. You know what? You can do one of those four things, but the thing you have to realize that is that even after you do any of those things or all of those things, your pain will still be there. It'll still be there. There is a better way. There's a better way. Look at what the text says. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Here's the better way. What you need to realize is that when you find yourself in the valley, if you're not in it now, it will come one day for you. When you find yourself in the valley, the better way is to realize that your good shepherd is in the valley with you, leading you, caring for you, comforting you, providing for you, and he is committed to walking every single inch of your valley with you. And the beauty is that our good shepherd, Jesus Christ, never wastes pain. Do you realize that? Like he never wastes a drop of hurt. And he is capable of taking pain that seems pointless to you and making it productive. That's, that's what make God, makes God amazing, that he can take pain that the world says is pointless and he can make it productive. And I promise you, if you will cling to your shepherd, you know what you might see happen in your life? You might see this ever-increasing intimacy in influence flowing out of your valley. Look at what David says. He says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You know why I find that interesting? Because in the first three verses of Psalm 23, what word does he use? He uses the word he. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores me. He, he leads me in paths of righteousness. But then we find him in the valley of the shadow of death. He says, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Do you see the movement towards intimacy? It's as if David's valley has been a breeding ground for, closeness, for, for intimacy with his shepherd. He's moved from he to you because he knows that his shepherd is in the valley with him. I promise you, if you will cling to your shepherd, don't be surprised if you see God move in ways that you would never get to see him move if everything in your life was just working out how it should work. Don't be surprised if you get to experience him providing for you and giving you unexplainable joy. Even when you're hurting, New levels of intimacy, but not just intimacy, also influence. Look at what it says in verse five. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. This is interesting that it says, you prepare a table before me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. That's just an interesting picture. That God is kind of playing waiter or waitress and he's kind of prepping a table while all of your enemies are just sitting around thirsty for your blood. That's just an interesting picture. 
But the deal is, is anytime God prepares a table, it's usually a feast. And it's always full of joy and laughter. You know what this means? It means it doesn't matter what is coming at you right now. God can still have joy waiting for you in the midst of your enemies. And a lot of times that joy comes from God giving you greater influence in the midst of your pain. I love what a guy named Levi Lusco says. He says that God wants to take your pain and turn it into your platform. Are you willing to believe that your greatest impact in this life, your greatest influence might actually be what comes of your life because of what God does in the valley of the shadow of death? A few weeks ago, I was... um, I was, I lead a ministry breakaway in College Station, and uh, after I spoke, this girl came up to me, and she said, you know what, I just felt like I was supposed to come up and share my story with you. I just felt like you needed to hear it. And so what she told me, um, her story in short was, she, she's about 18, 19 years old right now, five years ago. Um, When she was 14, her mom and her sister and her aunt were all three killed in a car accident. And uh, so I reached out to her and I just said, hey, could I share your story with students at Breakaway? And she wrote back, and, and when she wrote back, what she did was she cut and pasted this post that she had put on Facebook just the night before I had reached out to her. And the reason I tell you that is to say, what I'm about to read you wasn't a response to my request. No, what I'm about to read you was just something that was just overflowing out of her onto her social media platform. She just felt prompted to write it. And here's what she wrote. She said this. She said, let's talk about pain, pain, Pain hurts, but dare I say, pain is beautiful. The beauty that can come through pain is breathtaking. This is an 18 or 19-year-old girl writing. Only one being in existence is able to turn something so awful into outstanding beauty. I've known pain in my short life, but oh, how much beauty God has turned my pain into. I promise if I, if I could explain how he does it, I would. Sometimes I wonder if God made his love so overwhelming that it's indescribable on purpose, or I just need to increase my vocabulary. But with all my heart, I can say, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's been five years. I miss my mommy, Glory, and Auntie, but I know for sure I'm going to see y'all soon. Isn't that amazing? You know what that is? That's intimacy and influence. Do you see those two things at play? Intimacy with her saying, you know, uh, God's love is overwhelming for me, but also influence. I read her letter to 4,500 students, and afterward, you know what students came up to me and talked about? That letter, them saying, that's my story. Influence. When you find yourself on the sky coaster of pain, you know what you can declare? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The last aspect of life where we want control but don't have it is when it comes to our future. Anyone here honest enough to just say that you're stressed out about your future? It's okay, you don't need to raise your hand. (laughs) We stress out about our future. We stress about the future of our kids. We stress about the future of our careers. We stress out the future of our, our finances, our portfolios. There's plenty to stress about when it comes to our futures. And we want to, we want to control our futures. If you're single, you might settle for the wrong relationship. Whatever the case is, we make our five and ten year plans where we expect for things to go how we plan for them to go. Hopefully I'm not the first person telling you that often plans and reality go in two totally different directions. You don't need to control your future. There's a better way. 
Psalm 23, 6 says this, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And here we go. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you know what this is? It's perspective. Perspective is the key to a peaceful present. Let me just see if I can illustrate this for you um, real quick. I, I just want to ask them to turn all the lights off in this place real quick. And if I could have my friend Mike just turn on his cell phone light here at Klein, Matthew, at the Woodlands, if you just turn your light on. You guys see Mike's light, or if you're at the Woodlands, you see Matthew's light. I want you to think about that one light. That one light is your 80 years here on this earth. Just think about that. All of your stress, all of your anxiety are found in that one light. That's it, that one light. Now, the interesting thing and the good news is that God cares deeply about your 80 years here. He's the one who, who wrote the pages of those 80 years. So he cares about what happens in the midst of that one light. He, he cares about your time here. He has great plans for your 80 years here. But that is where you're at right now. You are somewhere in the midst of that one light. Now, I need everyone else in here to pull out your phone and just turn on the flashlight on your phone real quick. Just do me a favor, pull it out and turn it on. Some of y'all are trying to figure out how to work the flashlight for the first time ever. <laughs> It's okay, it's a good thing for you to know. <laughs> Let me ask you this, can anyone still pinpoint Mike's light in the room? I want you to think about this, if Mike's light is your 80 years, then all of the other lights represent all of eternity. Here's the good news, your good shepherd has your entire eternity under control. Listen to what Jesus says in John 14. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. This means Jesus, our good shepherd, has already gone and prepared a place for us. And a day is coming where he will come back and take us to where he is. We will dwell in his house forever. Our eternity is secure. But here's the good news. He still sees your one little light. He still cares about it. It's still significant to him. It still matters to him. If the one who has your eternity under control also planned out your 80 years here, you don't need to be in control because he already is. When you find yourself on the sky coaster of your future, here's your response. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You can put your lights away. Thanks for your help. I want you to know if you're here this morning and you believe in Jesus Christ, but still need to be in control, what you need to understand is that there's a trust issue going on in your life. You're, you're wrestling with a trust issue in the goodness of your shepherd. So what you really have to decide is if you believe your shepherd is good or not. But Jesus says in John chapter 11, I am the good shepherd. What makes him a good shepherd? Well, he clarifies it for us. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. You want to know if Jesus Christ cares. If you want to know if he's good, all you have to do is look at the cross on which he voluntarily bore all of your sin and shame. He put it in the ground and then walked out of a tomb so that you could be freed. This is our good shepherd. I'll end by telling you this. I'll end by just going back to that Texas sky coaster. It's interesting as that crane began to lift us up in the air. Do you know what we did? We began to like grasp our harnesses. We began to cling to each other. Because something in us still wanted some semblance of control. But can you imagine how ridiculous we must have looked 
to the people on the ground as we sat there and were basically giving ourselves self-hugs because we wanted to feel like we're in control, even though we had zero control. You know what the only proper posture is when you're riding the Texas Sky Coaster? It's this. It's arms stretched out. You know what that is? That's a position of joy. It's a position of realizing you're not in control and that's okay because you don't need to be in control. It's a position of joy, but this morning, it's also a position of surrender where you simply come to a place where you say, Jesus Christ, I don't need to be in control because you already are. And because you are my good shepherd, I lack nothing. I will fear no evil. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we... Um, we desperately need to hear that truth. We are people who are stressed out. We are people who are anxious. We are people living unhealthy lives where we are consumed with busyness. We are people that want to know if we're enough. We're people who want to control our pain. We are people who are really anxious and lose sleep about our future. But Lord, you have rigged life for us to need you. And so, Lord God, I just thank you that we don't have to be in control this morning because you already are. And so, Lord God, may our posture today be the same posture that we would take on a Texas sky coaster, one with arms stretched out, just saying, we trust you. You're a good shepherd. You are trustworthy. We don't need to be in control because you already are. We need you, Lord Jesus, this morning. Do a work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I'm joined today by Timothy Atik, who just preached a sermon on Psalm 23 called Who's in Control Here? Timothy, thank you so much for being here with us yeah, today. Yeah, I love being back at Faith Bridge. Oh yeah, it's always a party. Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, a few questions that came in, um, uh, mostly about uh, talking about pain. And yep. so at the end of your sermon, you talked about a letter that a young girl wrote that yep. you shared with Breakaway, um, in which she said that her pain became a platform. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that a little bit, how pain can become a platform? Yeah, well, if you think about it, I mean, pain is a part of everyone's story. Right. If it hasn't been, it will be at some point. And, you know, God never wastes your pain. He can take your story. And what, what I found with that girl's story is that it was so many other people's story as well. Right. They were yeah. coming up to me at Breakaway saying, that is my story. Mm -hmm. And so for this girl to believe she doesn't have a story to hide, but a story to tell, right. it, God gave her that story or allowed her to, to flourish even in the midst of her pain so that she can then share a story with others and point other people to, to hope in That's Jesus right. in the midst of the valley. That's right. And so I think, I think it is a matter of saying, you know what, I wouldn't have chosen this, mm -hmm. this story, but at the same time, I can't completely see everything that God can do through my story. So I'm going to trust that he wants to take my story and actually use it in other people's lives. And so right. I, I would hope, I encourage anyone, if God's given you a story that has pain in it, share it liberally. Right. Because you can't imagine the amount of people who are going to be like, okay, I've never shared this with anyone, but that's my story. I've gone through that. That resonates with me. And God's going to use it and exactly. give you the platform to point people to to hope that's exactly right yeah and yeah no one's going to avoid pain no yeah. one's going to avoid suffering yeah but if you can hear those stories of hope and yeah. how people came through suffering 
That's God was able to, you know, bring beauty from ashes, that kind of thing. Yeah. It can be uh, a witness That's um, right. to others. Absolutely. And so we have a couple practical questions sure. regarding pain as a platform. Great. Uh, the first was um, maybe practical ways that we could recognize uh, his will for us um, when we're given a platform through pain. Uh, I, I guess there's a lot of tor- turmoil and chaos that can come uh, when we're in the midst of pain. Um, and so how can we recognize how he wants us to use that pain as a platform? Uh, practically speaking. Yeah, I think it I think it kind of just goes back to what I just said of like I've got a friend who was in a was in a severe accident and has for over a year now having he's had to relearn how to walk. Oh, wow. And that's mm-hmm. been his his story. It's been the yeah. story of his family and we sat at breakfast and he was able to just say like he realizes that this is this is his story and he wants to share it. He doesn't know where he's supposed to share it, right. but he's available right. to share it. And I think I think that when you when you come to a place in your heart where you just say, God, I'm available, right. then you let God work it out. But that means, you know, if you're available to share your story, then tell the church and say, Hey, here's my story. I'm willing to share it. Whether it means just sharing it with one person right. or sharing it on a Sunday, I'm not seeking the stage. I'm just seeking to be faithful with the story God's right. given me. Absolutely. And so, you know, there, there's, I'm not a big fan of small talk. You know, when, right. when you're in conversation with people and as you meet people, as you journey through life, if God's given you a story, be really quick to just point people mm-hmm. to what God has done in your life and and see what God does. I can't give specifics now because everyone's life is different, but the main message is just be available and tell God that you are available and let him open up the doors. Right, well, and that's huge because especially when you're going through that pain, uh, I don't think anyone's expected to be like, okay, uh, here's exactly how I'm gonna use what I'm going through right now as a platform, but we can always say, uh, God use me. Yeah, um, I'm available. That's it, right? God loves to answer that prayer. Exactly. God use me. He, yeah. he, it might not be what you want it to look like, but He delights to answer that Absolutely. prayer. Absolutely. Yeah. So make yourself yeah. available. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Um, and then the other question um, came from someone who wants to know about. Um, so the pain they're experiencing has caused a lot of anger, and their pain was came from someone else. Um, sure. And so they want to know. Okay, I know this pain can be used as a platform, but I'm having trouble forgiving that person yep. who causes pain. Sure. Do you have any practical advice for how that person um, can move towards forgiveness? Yeah, well, you know what, that's a, I, I know none of the story or the background to this particular situation, yeah. but in my own experience with forgiveness, what I've found is that forgiveness, forgiving someone is rarely if ever a feeling. Yeah. You will never, feel like forgiving someone who's really wronged you. And if you wait till you feel like forgiving that person to actually forgive them, you probably will never forgive them. Forgiveness is often a choice you make despite how you feel. It's coming to a place where you realize that the person getting hurt the most by your bitterness and anger is actually you. It's not the person who wronged you, it's you. It's your soul that's getting eaten up. And so I think a lot of times when people think about forgiving someone else, they feel like to forgive someone they're losing. Mm. Like if I forgive that person, I'm telling them they won. Right, you're giving up higher ground there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that's not true. What you're winning is your joy. You're winning your joy back. Yeah. And so, you know, Jesus has set the model for us that he's forgiven us. We should forgive others. Forgiven people forgive people. That's a nice, it's easy for me to say it. Sure. It's hard to live out. But you know what? I believe forgiveness is an intentional choice you make to surrender your right to justice. Saying, right. I don't have to be right. I don't have to get even an apology or for this person to own up to everything. Just I need to keep my side of the street clean, which means I'm not going to let this rob me of joy anymore. I'm going to release this person and let God take care of the rest. And and that's often a process. Yeah. You know, that's not just like an overnight switch you flip and then you're done with it. You know, for me, I went through a really traumatic experience where I forgave people. And then it was a constant discipline when bitterness would creep up to say, well, wait, 
I, I gave up my right, right to bitterness right? because I already forgave them. Yeah. So I don't have the right to be angry or bitter anymore, but I did. It's a, you know what? You're, what you think determines how you feel, how you feel determines how you act. Right. We want to do things based on how we feel, but you have to trace it all the way back to your thought. When you sure. tell yourself, I've already forgiven this person, right. then your feelings will follow and that all your right. actions will follow that. So. That's right. Yeah, so forgiveness is it's really an act of faith in, in which we're doing it out of trust and obedience. That's right. Rather than just, I don't feel like it yeah. uh, right now. And then, and then we do trust that God will then use that forgiveness That's to right. transform our own hearts um, yeah. and hopefully to you know, bring some reconciliation. Yeah. Uh, yep. there. Yeah, that's uh, incredibly helpful. And Timothy, thank you so much uh, okay. for being here. Really always enjoy having yeah. you here. And thank you all for tuning in. We'll see y'all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.